Okay, hello everybody. Uh, we have a very special guest today. It's Ben Wolf, who's the author of uh, Fractional Leadership, Landing Executive Talent You Thought Was Out of Reach. And I think it's a very, very good title, Ben, because it summarizes very well the content of your book, which I uh, already have, have read, and it's inside here somewhere. Uh, <laughs> So thank you for um, letting me interview you for a while today. Can you can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I well, I, first of all, it's an honor to join you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this topic. Yeah. Uh, you know, the I actually came from being a corporate bankruptcy attorney before this. Uh, which I did for a number of years, after which I joined a healthcare startup uh, in New York State and uh, helped build most of the operations of that until it was uh, the largest and fastest growing healthcare agency of its entire category in the whole state of New York. I learned a whole lot from that process, uh, obviously made a lot of mistakes and learned a lot, uh, spent time as a chief operating officer of another small healthcare company, and then went on my own uh, and created Wolf's Edge Integrators, which is a fractional or part-time outsourced chief operating officer, COO firm. Uh, I started off just as a solo practitioner, doing it by myself. After about 14 months, I got to be, you know, having a full load of clients, a, for, a full portfolio of clients where I was serving as fractional COO, fractional chief operating officer, and then over time, continued getting leads, and over time, ended up turning that into a firm, Wolf Sedge Integrators, uh, which now at this point has 12 team members. We've got 12 fractional COOs, all people who've owned and run businesses before, serving in that COO role, each uh, with multiple companies. And uh, while all that was going on, I was making a lot of connections and having a lot of conversations in this whole fractional executive world in the United States. And we, uh, I just saw a big gap. You know, there were thousands of individual practitioners of solopreneurs who were acting as fractional executives of one kind or another, whether it's marketing, sales, operations, finance, technology, people, some other things like customer experience and some other more esoteric uh, sort of disciplines within the executive world. And, uh, there's just thousands of these people out there and no center of gravity, no kind of nothing uniting all of them. Everybody just kind of advocating for their own service, uh, which is great. And many of them did a great job at it. But I saw there was no center of gravity for this fractional executive universe. I think in some parts of Europe, they call it portfolio practice, serving as a portfolio executive. And um, I just saw a lack of any centralization, a lack of any center of gravity. So I decided to fill that. I created Fractional Leadership, which anybody can learn about. And we have several members in, in Europe and Africa, North Africa, uh, in the um, uh, at fractionalleadership.io. People can learn about that. But anyway, I started this professional association called Fractional Leadership. Uh, I started um, a podcast, the Win-Win Podcast, which has now been going on over three years, sharing information that's useful to business owners with, with a particular focus on the fractional executive world. Uh, and also wrote that book that you mentioned, Fractional Leadership, Landing Executive Talent You Thought Was Out of Reach, uh, which is not only available on Kindle, it's also on uh, paper and hardcover and also audiobook if 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 you like audiobooks. And um, so, yeah, that was almost two years ago, Amazon bestseller. I wrote another book, hopefully coming out next year for fractional executives. Uh, it's going to be called The Fractional Leader's Handbook, How to Set Up Your Practice, Get Clients and Deliver with Excellence. So a different target market. Uh, but really just trying to advocate for and educate about this space because it's such a great solution for what I call in the book, the entrepreneurial catch 22. You know, somebody's got their business has grown enough. They're past the startup phase and it's grown enough. They want to scale, uh, but they're kind of scaled as much as they can without experienced leadership, without anybody on their team who's actually done this before, knows what they're doing. So they don't have to reinvent the wheel and just kind of experiment and and just be beyond their own skill set in so many ways. Uh, so it's just a great 
solution for that and for people who can't afford the full-time experienced executive. Uh, so they're kind of caught between these two worlds. So, you know, as you know, and I'm sure you always speak about, uh, the fractional executive is sort of the bridge to that entrepreneurial catch-22 uh, to help get them that high-level experience at a much lower cost point than it would be for such a person of that caliber full-time. Uh, and they can help bridge the gap for 6, 12, 18, 24 months or whatever the period is. And then hopefully get them ready to maybe bring on somebody full time uh, when they've scaled to that point where that becomes possible. I think I went on probably too long answering that question, but no, that, 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 that's great. You're a very busy man, so so yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you for your for that summary. Um, would you would you say that this is a big trend in in the U.S.? Uh, would you say that this is a global trend instead? Uh, how how do you see the outlook of the fractional services uh, in in general? Well, I can't speak very much to the glo globalness of the trend. Unfortunately, I'm not as knowledgeable about it. Uh, I could tell you a little bit of what I'm hearing from some people in uh, in France and North Africa uh, and in the UK, but um, but the uh, definitely it's exploding in the United States. That much I could tell you. Um, you know, there's there's so many people that have businesses that are at that point where they're just hitting their head against the wall. They're just trying and trying and they're just, they don't have the capacity in internally in themselves as business owners or within the current leadership team to overcome the challenges that they're facing or to achieve the dreams that they have, you know, of what they want to achieve and accomplish with their businesses. So uh, I think also after COVID-19 and after the whole process of everybody being locked down in their homes and forced to look at remote work, uh, even with their leadership teams, not just with, you know, kind of in the Philippines or something, but, you know, uh, even at the executive level being forced to experiment with that because they had no choice. Uh, many still hated it, but many realized, wow, that's, you know, I could actually not be limited by the people within 10 or 20 miles of my current location. Uh, you know, who are the right people. I could find a right person, you know, within hundreds, if not thousands of miles of my location. Obviously, time zone's still a challenge sometimes, but uh, but it just really opens up the ability to find the right people. And what that's whether it's full-time or, or fractional. But, you know, again, very often, again, you can't find or it's too expensive. You can't afford that full-time experienced high caliber executive that you might need for whatever it is, again, marketing, sales, operations, finance, technology. So, you know, people just became more open-minded to it. I think after COVID, obviously it was growing before that, I felt also, but definitely saw a huge uptick uh, after after the shock of, of the lockdowns and COVID kind of wore off when people realized they needed to move on with their lives. <laughs> and then it really, I think after that, I really felt personally and I heard from everybody else that it really exploded since then. Um, but definitely talking to people in France, the UK, uh, Morocco, Algeria, I mean, talk to people around and it is, uh, you know, it, it seems to be growing. It's, it's not, it's not growing as quickly, but I've, you know, from what I am hearing, it is growing. There's more people doing it, more people looking for it, more people looking to collaborate with others who are doing it, uh, you know, to find those scattered people who are doing it and get together and, and, join efforts and, and also cooperate. Sometimes, you know, one, hey, look, I'll do the marketing, you do the operations, or, you know, you do the finance, I'll do the operations or whatever it is. People are often, um, or you lead sales, I'll lead whatever. So I, I definitely am seeing that um, somewhat. Although I've talked to people in the UK who talk about this portfolio executive thing, and it sounds like in certain ways it's actually existed, it's existed for longer than it has in the United States over there. I mean, mm -hmm. it's existed in the United States, but it, it was, I guess, somewhat more known, maybe at bigger companies, but it was somewhat more known as serving it as an executive at multiple companies, portfolio executive. You know, it was something that was done for, at a larger corporate level for longer than it's been prominent in the United States. Um, but I think that to migrate down to the small and mid-sized businesses taking advantage of that executive talent maybe is not as not as well known. Uh, and is just now starting to grow in Europe. But you you could probably tell your viewers and listeners a lot more about that than I could. Well, well, no, I I, I really I, I agree with your your point of view. As far as I am concerned, 
what we see here in in Spain is that um, despite the this is a very great solution for many medium and uh, small size companies. Uh, it, it it requires a little uh, it requires uh, like a brave uh, leadership to to uh, buy it. Um, yeah. It's the early also, adopters. It's an early. Any early adoption is very challenging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but uh, despite that, uh, the one who tries repeat because they find that they can benefit from uh, experienced, talented professional uh, with a, for a fraction of, of a, the cost of a, of a full time job. So it's a it's a win-win solution. Um, yeah, yeah. We, we see that, and, and yeah, we are experiencing uh, we are experiencing as well a, a boost here in in Spain. Although um, many people still call it interim management, we are trying to uh, educate uh, the, the the market to to differentiate between interim and fractional. But uh, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. um how would you say is the selling process of a fractional leadership project in your opinion is it the same uh, you talked before that you uh, were a solo practitioner uh, uh, in your early times and now you you have you run your own firm is it the same to uh, sell it as a as a professional or or uh, or a firm is, are there differences between the selling process between them? Um, I mean, practically speaking, very often people do do it differently because the firm will have more resources to develop a more formal sales and, and proposal and onboarding process. So they just, because they have more resources, they've had longer to work on it, they have more clients. So they'll have more resources to develop that a little bit better. But in principle, I don't think it should be that different. I mean, even as a solo practitioner, I think that you're going to impress your prospects or potential clients a lot more if it doesn't feel to them like you're just speaking off the cuff, you know, just making it up as you go along. Right? Sometimes that makes people feel insecure that you don't really know what you're doing, that you're kind of making it up. Um and it may be that you're equally effective because you're just, you know, such an experienced executive that, you know, when you get in the situation, you'll, you know, you figure out what to do and you'll, you'll do a great job. But for the sales process, uh, sometimes if people don't feel like you have a methodology, if they don't feel like you have a well thought out existing methodology. And that's not the impression you give them when you're having initial conversations or when you're presenting what you do with clients, uh, then they may feel like, you know, you're just kind of making it up as you go along and they don't want to pay for your learning process while, while they pay your fees. So the uh, so I think that even for a solo practitioner, you're much better off um, putting your methodology, which maybe you do naturally, maybe you do it just through experience, but put it in writing, you know, mm -hmm. put it in writing, you know, what your process is, what you do with clients, and then put that on your website, put that on your LinkedIn profile as well, I show people, you know, I have a five-step process and an engagement and, you know, a three-step process and the sales pro sales and discovery process. Or maybe for every engagement, I'll do like a consulting thing for like one flat fee. And then we see about, you know, the engagement, you know, three months later or whatever your process is. Maybe you start with a an assessment and then you go into an engagement or just go straight into the engagement, whatever it is. But I think it's important to impress potential clients and not lose them because they get skittish and nervous about whether you really know what you're doing, whether you have a methodology, is put your methodology in writing, communicate it clearly and briefly, uh, not the whole the details, but communicate it clearly and briefly in your website, on your LinkedIn profile, or whatever platform is, is most common in the business world in Spain or wherever you are. And uh, uh, I think that in principle, it's really not that different as a solo practitioner than it is in a firm. I mean, the challenge you have as a solo practitioner is if you do, if you if you get a client or a prospect who's not a good fit for you, uh, then it's important to have other fractional executives you know 
uh, or other consultants or other marketing firms or other resources that you know that you could point them in the right direction and not just say, sorry, can't help. Good luck. You know, but like you should be able to help uh, because, I, you know, I think that's important. Um, and uh, yeah, other resources, um, you know, or, or just be able to refer them to your competitors. If uh, mm -hmm. if either you think that you're not a good fit for them or even if you would be a good fit, but you're just full, you're busy, you don't have availability right now, um, then you want to be able to point them in the direction of somebody else that you know you could trust uh, that's going to take care of them and do as good of a job as you would, uh, even if you don't have availability. I think as a solo practitioner, that that is something to think about. And that's part of why I created my firm is because mm -hmm. I was getting, I continued getting leads when I no longer had availability to take on new clients. And I don't want to say no, because why are people going to start giving me referrals? Or why are people going to continue giving me referrals if I just say, sorry, can't help? Like, okay, let me start referring to somebody else who can help or who has more availability um, mm -hmm. uh, or a firm who has, you know, multiple people with available, with potential availability. So I I didn't want to do that. So I start, I took calls with people even when I couldn't take clients and found out what they're looking for, reached out to other fractional executives I knew who I could refer them to. I got called, got on calls with them, make sure they have the right background, make sure they had availability. And then I'm like dealing with three or four leads at a time. And it was basically turning into a part-time job, like just to manage all the leads that I couldn't even help, just that I'm just referring yeah. to other people uh, because I wanted to be helpful. So I ended up saying, you know what, if I'm going to have a part-time job making referrals anyway, it might as well make it part of my own firm. So I started, <laughs> I started adding people and developing our processes and systems, but uh, that was kind of the genesis of the idea for me personally. But I think even, even as a solo, even if, even if you were going to stay as a solo, it's important to have a good referral network so you could send people in the right direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, which, which would be, uh, in your opinion, the most common pitfalls when dealing with a fractional leadership projects, which are um, the main reasons for, uh, uh, for not achieving a, a full success? I would say the number one reason is taking the wrong clients because you're desperate for clients. <laughs> That's a good the, advice. Taking the wrong clients, right? So you need to be clear also in having in writing clearly thought out for yourself. What is your ideal client? You know, some qualities that people look for in ideal clients are people who people who are who they can afford your fees, first of all. Mm -hmm. They're coachable. I mean, they want to learn. They want to hear something new, not that like their way is the only way. Nobody knows better than me. You know, people who have some humility, they they value your expertise. They want your expertise. They want to listen to you. Mm -hmm. And not that like you know, they don't listen to anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they, I don't know, they think, I don't know, sometimes they think they could just like hire somebody or push a button and then all their problems go away in their business without them mm -hmm. having to change. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're the problem. And if you can't get their buy-in on the on the transformations that you need to make or the changes that you need to make in order to help them be successful in achieving the goals that they told you they want to achieve, then if they're not going to go along with that, support that, back it up with action, uh, you know, if they're always going to want to revert back to their old ways of doing things and their old ways of behaving, and they're not going to listen, they're not going to be coachable, they're not going to support doing what's actually necessary. There's an expression, I don't know if you guys have it over there, you could lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Uh, yeah. you, know, you could kind of paint the picture of what the road to success looks like. Hey, look, I've done this before. I've seen what's going to happen. I know the future. <laughs> like, you know, if you want to be successful, you know, this is the path you've got to go on and I'll walk there with you. I'll lead your team there. But if they're not going to go along with you, they're not going to support it. If they're not going to make the changes necessary to create a new reality for themselves. You know, that uh, there's another expression that what got you here is not going to get you there. Yeah. And if people are not willing to do what it takes to get where they ostensibly say they want to go, uh, then ultimately the engagement is going to end in frustration and possibly anger 
and um, just frustration, and it's not going to go well. But it, it, it's really, it's not just, you could blame it on them because they're not coachable, but you also have to blame yourself as yeah. the fractional executive because I took a client because I really wanted a client that, you know, without being more discerning and without trying to turn them away and ask the hard questions before the engagement began uh, to make sure that they were a right fit client, for me and for even the possibility of success. Cause some people just are not wired in their DNA, I think to succeed yeah. in a scaled business, they might be good yeah. for a small business and a few helpers, but not for, you know, a real scaled business. We, we've been through that uh, a couple of times. Yeah. Um, and the willingness of, of having a new customer uh, usually takes over. But at the end of the day, yeah, uh, you uh, not not everyone is well prepared for a project like this. Uh, I mean, it, I I believe it's the uh, best solution for most cases that we find in, in medium and small sized uh, companies. But uh, not every CEO is uh, is the right man or woman to to uh, hold this kind of of relationship, which is. Uh, something a little bit strange in a, in a way uh, for them. Um, uh, and sometimes it happens that uh, it's very um, fresh to have new ideas, but, but the leaders need to, to be ready to, to take them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes I, they're not in enough pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's right. That is right. They they, they feel they uh, can keep up with the things as they have been doing them. Uh, the things that they have reached a certain point, which is uh, uh, difficult to, to cope with, because uh, if you want to uh, to continue growing, then your leadership is not enough for for to handle every kind of, of situation, every function uh, in, inside the organization. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How, how would you describe the perfect uh, fractional leader? Uh, how do they look like? Uh, that's a very broad question. Not sure where to start. Uh, I think one of the things I would think is it, if somebody is listening to or watching this who is considering maybe a fractional executive practice, but they're not sure yet, they're not sure if they're a good fit for it or if it is a good fit for them. Um, one thing I make sure to tell anybody considering doing this, I don't know if you're asking, are you asking from the fractional executive's point of view or from the client's point of view? Well, um, I, I don't know. In general, um, uh, perhaps you can advise some some people who are considering to to enter this this world as a fractional leader, or and uh, how to spot a, a good fractional leader when you're looking for that that kind of service. Uh, I don't know. Um, I I'm wondering uh, which are the differences between uh, a good professional uh, and a good uh, fractional leader? Because I have my opinion about that, but I would like to to uh, listen to yours. Sure. Well, I'll share mine, but I'll, I would love to hear yours also. Uh, okay. One thing I would say, the difference, oh, you know, one of the main differences that a person needs to understand between full-time and fractional is that when you're a full-time executive, your employer is taking responsibility for your income. But when you are a fractional executive, a solo practitioner, you are responsible for your own income. You're responsible for finding your own clients. And that, and it's important to understand that that will always be the case. I mean, that will be the case for the rest of your career. It's not a the the need to do business development to network to help people to you know to talk to 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 try to get public speaking in front of target market clients etc the need for whatever kind of business development and marketing that you're going to do the need for that is never going to go away and so you need to either love that or be willing to embrace it in the long term for the rest of your career at least as long as you're a independent executive because um 
if you think this is like the hard truth that I always share with people, if you think that you could just kind of like leave your full-time job or, you know, do kind of a massive campaign of networking and business development for a while and then get a bunch of clients and then your clients are going to refer you to all their friends and you'll never have to do business development again for the rest of your life. If that's yeah. what you think. Then you're in for a rude awakening, as they say. Yeah. Yeah. It is not going to work long term. I mean, it may work at the beginning, but eventually that initial set of clients and those initial connections of connections are going to dry up and your clients are going to come to their natural or not so natural engagement conclusions and you'll find yourself without clients. And if you're not doing business development, without a pipeline of potential new clients. Uh, so, you know, and then you're going to, then you're going to be starving for business and, and you're going to need money. And so you're going to go back into massive action, scramble, panic mode, business development again for another few months until eventually, hopefully, if you're fortunate, you get clients again. And then you just find yourself, you're going to find yourself in this feast or famine roller coaster for the rest of your career, or you know, which is probably just going to be so frustrating, you're just going to go back and take a job again. Um, so I think that it's important if you want to be successful in this to have an understanding when you go into it that business development is part of my job description. Just like if you have a member of your team, you want to make sure that they're able to consistently execute well on all of the parts of their job description or otherwise they're not right for their role. Uh, same thing applies to you. One of the one of the bullet points in your role as a fractional executive is business development, unfortunately. I mean, you're going into it not because you love BD, for at least most of us. You go into it because you're great at marketing or you're great at sales or you're great at operations or finance or whatever the discipline is, uh, but not, the, not specifically because you're great at selling yourself or doing business development for yourself uh unfortunately that but so but you need to be willing to at least you have to you have to either be somebody who does love doing that and is naturally good at it or you're just willing to embrace it in the long term and feel that that flexibility of being on your own and do, working with multiple clients and the more satisfying work and the greater variety and the lack of or, or, or the much less administrative annoying work that you need to do with your clients, you know, than you are when you're full time uh, is worth it, you know, and you just have to make that balance and decide if that's something you're willing to embrace or that you love. And if so, then it could be good for you. Uh, if not, and I'm assuming here that you're a great executive. Uh, like that's, you know, kind of like baseline, right? You're great at whatever your function is. Uh, but beyond that, you, you also have to embrace business development long term. I, I have the very uh, same uh, vision that that, mm, that you do. I mean, um, you the, the the need for soft skills or uh, Simon Sinek says human skills are more important for a fractional manager manager or leader than for a, a full time professional. Uh, I mean, you need to be a salesperson in every Every day, in in a way, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you are in finance or in operations or whatever. Yeah, you have to you have to sell yourself, your your company or whatever. Um, also, um, I had found that um, the there's a, a sweet spot for uh, fractional leaders, which is. Uh, in the middle of being uh, very versatile and very specialized. Uh, you, you, you can be a great professional if you are very specialized, but uh, if, you, if you go into a fractional project, uh, you need to be, uh, you have a, uh, to, uh, to broaden your, your view. Your uh, specialty is no longer uh an advantage by itself you you um you, you need to be more versatile i don't know if you mm -hmm. if you agree with that well i i think it is definitely important to have enough knowledge to be dangerous about a wide variety of areas if nothing else so that you could effectively spot issues you may not be able to solve them but you at least be able to spot them 
We have to have enough mm-hmm. knowledge to spot issues in a, in, a, in a wide variety of areas of the business. Uh, you know, and again, you don't have to be a jack of all trades who can do everything and solve everything. But if you could spot the issue, if you can facilitate a conversation with the business owner so they know what to do about it, and if it's along the current priorities, then you can, with that networking and relationship development and referral network that you've developed, you know, refer in good people or good resources for the gaps that you identify. But if you don't, you know, again, have a broader view, as you point out, it definitely makes a lot of sense uh, that you wouldn't be able to spot those issues. You wouldn't be able to add the kind of value that you would if you're just, you know, super like heads down, not looking at anything else. And and that's actually one of the reasons why in our fractional leadership community, um, again, fractionalleadership.io, sort of a plug, the in our fractional leadership community, um, that's why we have every month a professional development events besides the networking and like peer advisory events. We have a we have a professional development event where people um, where we bring in speakers and most of the speakers are actually other members of the fractional leadership community. So we have a marketing expert, a CMO that's teaching about certain basic concepts of marketing. So everybody else, regardless of what their specialty is can understand more about marketing, spot issues in marketing with their clients, and also get better at marketing themselves as solo practitioners or as firm owners. And, um, you know, same thing. So we have, you know, very often, that's why we do that. Because, you know, if I can get a little more knowledge about finance, a little bit more knowledge about HR and people operations, more knowledge about sales, uh, then I could, it'll help me in my own business as a solo practitioner or firm owner. And it'll also help me help my clients better. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, we we are trying to do the same here in in, in Spain, in Italy, the, the firm that I am running because uh, because yeah, it it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but uh, also, I mean, uh, as long as we are counting on senior executives, we see that uh, the more senior that you are, the more holistic view of the company that you have. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, you may have started in finance, for example, but as long as your career develops, you start um, picking different areas of, of the company. So at the end of the day, many, many, I mean, we we don't see uh, pure profiles in, in our network. Um, there's always a, a mixture of, of uh, competencies mm-hmm. and areas of, of expertise. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you you are clear a uh, high performing professional and, and leader. Um, I'm wondering um, if I'm wondering Ben, in in terms of habits uh, that are in your life, maybe one or two things that you're doing on a regular basis that you feel are key to to the success that you have achieved. Uh, can you can you um, share with us uh, any lifestyle or habit that are essential to that? Uh, sure, I'll share a couple. Um, one, uh, one is uh, one habit is time blocking, uh, not just for meetings, but for important things that you need to work on. Uh, as of whether you're full time, whether you have a business, whether you're a fractional executive, there's important projects that you're working on. Maybe getting a website built or. Uh, you know, whatever it happens to be, maybe building a a template for one of the major documents you're going to use with your clients or writing a contract to use with your clients or whatever it happens to be. So you have all kinds of projects you need to work on. And so if you just say like, okay, I got, I I just know in general that I need to work on this project uh, and and I'll hopefully find time to do it. uh, Doesn't work very well. I mean, you need to block out sufficient time to get the project done in the amount of time that you think it should be done in. Uh, And that time you put it on your calendar, just like you do a meeting. Uh, And just like you wouldn't schedule one meeting at the same time as another meeting, you don't schedule a meeting or even a sales call at the same time as you blocked out time to work on, on your projects. Uh, You might, you know, you might move around that time if you need for a sales call or something, obviously that's important, but you move it around. You don't just, ignore it or blow through it. And that's one habit I think is time blocking for things that are make time for things that are important because otherwise 
clearing your email box or talk, you know, networking meetings or whatever is just going to take over and you're not going to work on the things that are important, but not as urgent. Um, and um, the other thing I would say is to, uh, you know, make one list in one place of all your major to do's and projects that just all like, whether it's on paper, whether it's in an app like Asana or whatever, just keep everything, or it's a Google Doc, whatever it is, just keep everything in one place. And then pick a half hour a week. Maybe it's on a Sunday before the week starts. Maybe it's first thing Monday morning, whatever it is. You block that time again, so it's blocked. And you review that list and prioritize it. Okay, the top, if I could only get three things done this week, you know, it's going to be one, two, and three. And then and then plan your week. That's not saying to do it on a Sunday. And then just, if you do that every Sunday, you plan your week. You say, okay, by the end of this week, these are the three things that I want to have accomplished. I want to get 50% of my website copy written, or I want to, you know, write the first draft of the, you know, the uh, contract with my clients or whatever, you know, and write the first draft of the template that I'm going to do when I do my initial assessment with clients, whatever it is, you know, I want to do the I want to do that, or I want to write 25% of the of that template or whatever it is. Just make it your goals. This is what I'm going to accomplish by the end of the week. And then block out time, set aside the time through the week when you're going to work on those things. So it combines with that time blocking technique, but you're not going to feel overwhelmed. You're not going to feel like everything's getting away from you. Like you're always working on clearing your email box and random admin work or random meetings that aren't leading to any centralized goal. Uh, if every week you just kind of get in a habit of of planning your week and prioritizing your week, so that way you know that it's not getting away from you. Everything's in one place. You know what your priorities are. You prioritized it. You start living intentionally, and you feel like you're more in control of your life and your business and your career. I wish I had this meeting before. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I have to admit that uh, I, I follow that rules. Um, I follow those rules, yeah. But uh, since, like, I don't know, five or six months ago, um, but it would be would have been very nice to, to follow those um, from the early stage of my career because I think, I think those are uh, very good examples. And not only for fractional leaders or... Or yeah, our contractors. Yeah. So no, yeah, that's full time. It's really anybody. I mean, anybody yeah. that wants to accomplish things in life. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Uh, the the last advice uh, that I asked you for. Um, can you recommend any any reading, any book that you have came across lately, and that, that uh, I don't know uh, that you have uh, um, tagged or read and. and, and yeah, you liked. Sure. Well, one I would say is the one over my left shoulder here, which is uh, which is "Who Not How" by Dan Sullivan and Dr. Benjamin Hardy. Uh, it's a simple concept behind the book, but it's so valuable, especially for what we do as fractional executives, which is uh, which is the concept of if something important needs to get done and you want to get something important done, instead of always asking how do I do this which is a huge lift and a big effort to learn how and figure it out. And it's a new skill. Ask who could help me do this. That's what you're getting your clients to do is instead of trying to reinvent the wheel and figure out how to run a finance department or how to run a marketing operation or how to run a sales operation or how to run an operations operation, you say like, get someone like you in place and let you figure out the how. And they'll, they'll just have to find the right who, find the right person to, to do it. Uh, and that's what you're asking your clients to do. And you could do the same thing in your own life, right? When instead of having to figure out, oh, how do I do social media? How do I do a website? If you can, you know, either pay somebody or do some kind of collaboration or cooperation or whatever, just find the right who or get an assistant, you know, to help with some of the more administrative tasks. So just find a who for as many things in your life as you can so they could figure out the how, the specific how of how to do whatever it is, somebody who's good at that. Uh, and then you can focus on higher level hows, like whatever it is that's your magic superpower that you're good at, you could focus on the hows of that 
That's your that's your superpower. That's where you're going to shine. And you're going to achieve ten times more than anybody else could because it's your area of expertise. It's your unique ability. Uh, and for everything else that's outside of your unique ability, to the extent possible, you know, collaborate with or hire or somehow find who's who can work on that. That's kind of the theme of the book. But it was like very very influential for me. When I read this book, I read it twice in one day. The first day that I read it. Uh, so I, I, I often recommend, it's a very easy read. I mean, it's in English, so if you speak English, it's a very easy read, <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, it's very simple, very simple writing, very simple book. Uh, but it's, uh, I, I found it to be very helpful. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We will read it. We will read it. Um, uh, Ben, this has been a very inspiring conversation. I thank you a lot, um, for it. Um, Your book is uh, it's very recommendable as well. Uh, remember of, for our audience, fractional leadership, uh, landing executive talent you thought was out of reach. It's available in Amazon uh, in the Kindle version, but also in the hard or soft covers. Um, in audio. In audio. Um, uh, it has a lot of stars like, I don't know, 4.8, as I saw it before, uh, out of five. So uh, it's not only a recommendation of mine, but uh, from, from uh, I'm almost a almost people. 80 reviews so far. <laughs> 80 reviews, very good, very good. Uh, you can find also uh, Ben in fractional leaderships uh, leadership .io and in Wolf's Edge Integrators. Um, tomorrow, you know, To more know about Ben Wolf and his activity. Uh, ben, I want to, to thank you so much for coming on here and spending some time with us. It's very, it's very good to, to have you. Thank you so thank you so much. It's been an honor. I appreciate it. Thank you.